السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين My dear viewers, welcome to another live edition of our program Gardens of the Pious and today's episode is number 510 in the blessed seas of Gardens of the Pious by Imam Nawawi, may Allah have mercy on him. And today, inshallah, it will be the 10th edition in chapter number 234. Without any further ado, the first hadith in this episode is hadith number 1329. We have gotten a sound hadith which is very much similar to the last hadith we studied in the previous episode with something new in it, the last statement. An Urwat al-Bariqi radiyallahu anhu anna al-Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal al-khayru ma'qudun fi nawasiha al-khayru ila yawm al-qiyamah al-ajru wal-magnam muttafaqun alayhi. So Urwa al-Bariqi, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Goodness is tied and adhering to the four heads of the horses until the day of resurrection. Then he said, Al-Ajr al maghnam meaning Al-Ajr, the reward in the hereafter. al maghnam refers to al ghanima which is the war spoils upon achieving victory. We did study this hadith in the previous episode without the last statement of Al-Ajru wal maghnam which is the explanation. We also stated in the previous episode that things are going to turn around and the need for horses is until close to the Day of Judgment. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put a lot of emphasis on raising and upbringing horses, training horses, looking after them, especially if your intention, if they're being used currently uh, on the battlefield, if that is your intention, you will be rewarded for it. You will be rewarded for feeding them, for giving them the drink, for treating them, every aspect in their lives, you will be rewarded for it, as long as that is your intention. But currently, Horses are not being used on the battlefield. Maybe they are being used by the police forces uh, to maintain security domestically, but not on the battlefield. Um, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Khair, which is the goodness. Al-Khair means horses. In order to link between both of them, as far as the forehead, it doesn't refer only to a segment of the horse, rather, it refers to the entire horse and all horses which are being used for the purpose of jihad. Min babi dhikr al-ba'di wa iradat al-kull. Sometimes in Arabic you refer to the entire thing using a part of it. Like when we say sajda, while you actually mean the whole prayer. Rak'ah, and rak'ah consists of ruku' and it consists of sujood. While you actually mean the whole prayer. Aisha radiallahu anha said about the duha prayer, subhat al duha, referring to one thing that is recited in the duha prayer, which is tasbih. Because the prayer, any prayer, contains tasbih. Subhana rabbi al azim, ruku' subhana rabbi al a'la, in sujood. And you can even supplicate using tasbih otherwise. 
like in the beginning of the prayer, the beginning supplication. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik wa tabarak asmuk wa ta'ala jadduka wa la ilaha ghayru. So she says, I've never seen the Prophet sallallahu offering subhat al-duha wa inni la usalliha. So she confirmed that she offers the duha prayer while she mentioned in the beginning of the hadith, she called it subha. So when uh, the Prophet sallallahu says, Nawasi, which is plural of nasiya, it doesn't only mean a segment or a piece or a part of the cattle. Rather, it refers to the horse and obviously all the horses which are being used on the battlefield. Okay? So, the word al-ajru wal-magnamu. Al-ajr, the word in the hereafter. There will be following a hadith showing how much reward a person will get whenever he or she or they, they raise the horses for this purpose. That is concerning the hereafter. While al-maghnam, it is quite interesting because in, uh, in all the battles and the wars that happened during the Prophet sallallahu and after, whenever they won and there was war spoils, whether on the Battle of Badr, or uh, later on, on the conquest of Mecca, Hawazin and Thaqif, Hunayn, etc. So the Prophet Sallallahu used to give Al-Faris three shares, while the infantryman would get only one share. The infantryman, the fighter who is fighting on foot, would get one share. And the horseman will get one share for himself and two shares of the spoils for the horse. So the horse will get that much share of the spoils because the need of, you know, upbringing them, taking care of them or eating or even adding some more to the stable. That is the meaning of goodness are tied up and are connected to horses until right before the day of judgment as long as they are intended to be used for this purpose. The following hadith is, uh, I want to just bring to your attention that brothers and sisters, the last hadith in the previous episode was narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar, Muqattab, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Khaylu ma'qoodun fi nawasiha, al nawasi the four heads, Al-Khair, goodness, until the Day of Judgment, and that's it. While in this hadith of Urwa al-Bariqi, the statement which is added, Al-Ajru wal-Maghnamu, yani al ghanima And both a hadith are sound and agreed upon their authenticity. Um, the following hadith, if you bear with me, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in hadith number 1330 An Abi Hurairah radiyallahu anhu qal Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Man ihtabasa farasan fi sabili Allahi imanan billahi wa tasdiqan biwaadihi fa inna shiba'ahu wa rayyahu wa rawathahu وَبَوْلَهُ فِي مِزَانِهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ The hadith is a sound hadith and collected by Imam Bukhari. May Allah have mercy on him. Again, مَنْ اِحْتَبَسَ فَرَسًا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ إِيمَانًا بِاللَّهِ وَتَصْدِيقًا بِوَعْدِهِ فَإِنَّ شِبَاعَهُ وَرَيَّهُ وَرَوَثَهُ وَبَوْلَهُ فِي مِزَانِهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Amazing. In this hadith, our most beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, whoever keeps a horse for the purpose of jihad while believing in the oneness of Allah and relying on his promise, anticipating the promised reward, then he will find that its father drink, droppings, and urine will be all credited to him in the scale of his good deeds on the day of resurrection. 
What does it mean? I understand that when you grow a horse to be prepared to be sent to the battlefield. But again, you know, I know that somebody might have uh, started watching right now. So he comes across, uh, these guys are talking about fighting on the back of the horses. Do you think that uh, we're living in the Roman Empire or the Persian Empire? We're living in the uh, 12th century? Are you out of your mind? We're saying, we're studying the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and when we come across some ahadith, perhaps many of those ahadith were describing the condition that the Sahaba and the Prophet وسلم, were experiencing and were living back then, were studying for the purpose of learning. But by analogy, whatever applied there applies here. So when somebody is contributing to the Muslim army, to the resistance against the occupation forces, by any invention, making a drone, you know, fixing a tank, um, inventing a weapon that helps the soldiers on the battlefield, anything, not necessarily a horse. Back then, horses were essential. And that's why an army which have more horses, their chances of winning the war and overcoming their enemies on the battlefield are much greater than those who only fight, uh, you know, infantrymen or on foot. And that's why it was very surprising. It was very amazing on the battle of Badr because Muslims had only two horses and two horsemen. Very interesting. While the Meccans, it's an official army with 950 to 1,000 fighters. But they still, the 314, two horses, happened to overcome this huge army with all the horses and all the weapons that they brought with them. وَمَنْ نَصْرُ إِلَّا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ Victory only comes from the Almighty Allah. So if we're studying those hadith and currently we do not need the horses, I said we need them domestically, but not necessarily on the battlefield. But we say you never know. Maybe close to the end of time, people will resort back to using the swords, the spears, bow and arrows. In the States until today, we, we practice, you know, archery. It's a very interesting sport. And the Prophet ﷺ put a lot of emphasis on archery, on shooting and aiming at the targets. Okay? It is not simply and only for fun. There could be another purpose for it. And if you're good in archery, then you're good in shooting and aiming and focusing. So, we're studying those hadith, but if there is anything similar to it, can be beneficial for the Muslim army on the battlefield, any means of communication, uh, wireless communications, anything that navigation, navigator system that pe you know, s people invent in order to make it easier and to camouflage the Muslim army on the battlefield so they will be rewarded for that as well. Not because we're talking about horses, we're thinking that we're going to fight the drones, the tanks and the nuclear weapons with horses, of course not. When the Prophet وسلم, said back then, we need horses so much, so whoever grows up a horse and he is keeping the horse in the stable for this purpose. In this case, he's a believer, he's anticipating the, promise, the promised reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, فَإِنَّ شِبَعَهُ يعني its father. وَرَيَّهُ and its drink. وَرَوَثَهُ I understand the father and the drink. You'll be rewarded for that. But how would the person be rewarded even for the droppings, for the animal dung, for the droppings of the horses in the stable or in the field? And also its urine will be credited. All of that will be credited to him in his scale of good deeds on the day of resurrection. It reminds me with 
our predecessors who used to say إِنِّي لَا أَحْتَسِبُ نَوْمَتِي كَمَا أَحْتَسِبُ قَوْمَتِي Oh yeah, Al-Qiyam means to get up and to pray at night or during the day to do whatever is good including your acts of worship, your duties towards Allah to be fulfilled going out to work to earn your living to provide for your family and to give any charity you will be rewarded for all of that once you anticipate the promised reward and you are sincere in your intention so they used to say and I also one of them used to say and I also anticipate being rewarded for my sleep likewise not only for my awakeness and for my earning and for my worship but when I go to sleep I hope and I anticipate that the Almighty Allah will reward me likewise. Why? Because without this sleep, without this rest, I won't be able to function. I won't be able to go to work, to earn my living. I won't be able to worship properly. So I'm keeping balance and I hope that Allah will also reward me while asleep. Yeah, that's why. Do you learn from the Prophet when, when somebody is doing anything for the sake of Allah wholeheartedly then everything related to it will pour infinite reward for him in the scale of his good deeds. Just for the mere intention if the person was not capable to do it we studied a few episodes back somebody who is longing to be a shaheed why he didn't have a chance? He died on his bed. He's awarded the word of the Shahada. Somebody intended to get up at night and he slept uh, early and he made wudu. He recited his adhkar. The alarm went off. He did not hear it or he heard it and he uh, turned it off. Then he resumed sleeping. Don't worry. You will get the reward of getting up and praying. Why? Because it was your intention to get up and pray. But he did not get up. Because you were so tired, you had a huge fatigue, so you didn't get up. No problem. The Almighty Allah will give you the same reward. Oh, somebody used to fast Mondays and Thursdays, then he fell ill. He cannot fast anymore. He grew older. He's having now some renal failure or liver problems or stomachache. He cannot fast anymore. So anymore, anymore. As long as you used to do this when you were healthy, Whenever you sick until you die, you still get the same reward. Why? Because something out of your control, out of your choice, interrupted your worship, obstructed you and intercepted the good deed that you used to do. So the most generous Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep rewarding you. Unlike us as human beings, you studied very well for the finance. Throughout the year, the scholastic year, you are getting A+. Plus. Your report card throughout this classic year is amazing. Then on the way to the final, there was a car collision, there was an accident, a reason or another, whether you were involved in it or due to the heavy traffic, you got stuck. You did not make it, you couldn't make it. What is going to happen? Sorry, you will have to repeat the exam. You will have to wait another whole year to take it. But, you know, I did my best. And this reason and that reason, we don't recognize that. Allah does. Allah says, وَأَلَّيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى So he rewards for the pursuit. Even if you didn't get to accomplish, you tried. Don't worry, you will be rewarded. So that's why the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, if this is your intention, you're keeping the horses, you're training the horses, you're feeding the horses and taking care of them for this purpose, out of faith in Allah and anticipating the promised reward, you'll be rewarded for fodder, for the drink, for the urine, for the, uh, in the droppings, for everything. Subhanallah. And that also make us believe that there will be on the day of judgment mizan, the scale for each one of us, the scale. As for him whose scales of good deeds happen to be heavy, the right part, Allah weighs the good deeds in it. ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ ثَقُلَتْ يعني become heavy 
and outweighed the other part which has the bad deeds. So the good deeds are heavier. فهو في عيشة راضية. Then he will experience a pleasant life. Where in Al Jannah. وأما من خفت موازينه فأمه هاوية. As for him whose good deeds happen to be light, so the bad deeds outweigh the good deeds, then he will be thrown in Al Hawiya, which is his dwelling will be hell fire. It will be like his mother. He will abide therein. It will envelop him. May Allah protect us against that. The following hadith is a sound hadith. Hadith number 1331. I know some of the viewers who say, oh, so Shaykh, you've been talking about horses, horses, horses. What about camels? Don't they use camel too? Yes, of course. So any means, whether the horses, whether the camels, the arrows, they used to sharpen the arrows from the trees or the bamboos, okay, or steel. Anything that is prepared for this purpose. Because any ummah without force, without military, without a military force, without special forces to protect it, is gone. This ummah doesn't deserve to exist. You may happen to purchase weapons right and left. You pay hundreds of billions of dollars. You end up buying weapons from your enemies and the enemies of your friends and then you keep them in the storage. You keep them in the storage. For what purpose? So you can fight your own brothers. You can suppress and oppress your own citizens. Oh, in this case, every penny that is spent for this purpose is a curse upon you. That's why it all revolves around the intention. In this hadith, hadith number 1330, For the sake of Allah, believing in Allah and trust in His promise. This hadith, hadith number 1331. An Abi Mas'ud Radiallahu Anhu Jaa Rajulun Ilan Nabi Sallallahu فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لك بها يوم القيامة سبعمائة ناقة كلها مخطومة رواه مسلم Beautiful The messenger of Allah peace be upon him was sitting and a man came with ناقة and ناقة is a she camel while the camel is called بعير or جمل the male camel. So a man came to the messenger of Allah with a she camel wearing a nose string. And he said, this is a gift for the sake of Allah. Yani, I'm giving this naqa to you to send it with the Muslim army so that some soldier can ride on its back. This is for the sake of Allah. This is a gift in the cause of Allah. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, Well, you will have a return for it on the day of resurrection. 700 she camels and every one of them will be wearing a nose string. <laughs> what is a nose string? Al-Khutam, Makhtuma, means wearing a rain. But this rain or the string is actually beginning from the nose around the head so that the person, the rider, can control directing the she camel. Yani, whatever you will get, you will get 700 more, not missing anything of the original one, including the rain, that nose strange. You will get it. I know that somebody will be sitting out there and say, um, and what would you need camels for nowadays? Well, this is symbolic. Back then they used camels. Nowadays, mashallah, you can afford to donate anything similar to it that can be used and utilized on the battlefield, you will get 700 times more. Didn't the Almighty Allah say in Surah Al-Baqarah <clears throat> that those who spend their wealth out of sincerity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
مثل الذين ينفقون أموالهم في سبيل الله كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سنابل في كل سنبلة مئة حبة والله يضاعف لمن يشاء والله واسع عليم The likeness and the parable of those who spend their wealth, you name it now, fi sabilillah, for the sake of Allah, especially supporting your army, supporting the people who are protecting your back. You are worshipping in your masjid, in security. You are staying at home with your family in a peaceful environment. Why? Because there are people who are on the front line. They are guarding the borders. They are confronting the enemies in order to provide you with protection. Those who spend their wealth, any wealth, fi sabilillah, for the sake of Allah, like a single grain which produced seven ear corns. You know the corn, the, the, the grain when you plant it or when you sow it under the ground, it grows and each one is carrying seven ears. In each one, there is a hundred. So the 700 here is symbolic. And the Arab also said the 700 here refers to the infinite or like, you know, unlimited reward. Wallahu yudha'ifu liman yasha. And Allah multiplies the reward from ever he was, even beyond the fold of 700. So it is not limited to the camels bro in case that you're saying what is going to happen uh, also somebody else is going to say you know you said Allah will give him a return 700 camels on the day of resurrection what is he going to do with them they will be his are they realistic really 700 camels or that he will multiply their work for him equivalent to that but he will be beneficiary out of that in, in any case he wants to wander around, visit here and there in, in paradise. Would Jannah have animals? Yes, he would have animals. And he would have whatever you desire. لَهُمْ مَا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيد Anything that the people who enter Al-Jannah dream of, they will get it. And Allah says, and we even have more for them. لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَةً For those who did good, Al-Husna will be the reward. Al-Jannah will be the reward. Wa-Ziyadah, and we have even extra, more than Al-Jannah for them. And we spoke about what is a ziyada uh, before. Laka biha yawma al-qiyamati sab'u mi'ati naqatin kulluha maqtuma. Brothers and sisters, it's time to take a short break. And inshallah, we'll be back in a few minutes for some more. Please stay tuned. حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome back. Allow me to remind you with our phone numbers, beginning with the area code 002, then 0238551132. Alternatively, area code 002, then 0100549323. WhatsApp numbers, the code 001347806125. And uh, finally, last number, area code 001361489153. Assalamu alaikum. We have some callers on the line. Sister Fawzia from the United Kingdom. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Brother Salah? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing fine. Thank you for asking, Sister Fawzia. <laughs> Lovely to hear you. Every time I hear you, it's a great motivation for us and great knowledge you give. So, my question for today is our. First question is, uh, where I work, 
in the the place i work everywhere i can see that there are the pictures pictures of uh, i don't know different gods pictures of uh, just the modern pictures uh, of animals so every room i can see the pictures and when i pray i don't know that um, even in a staff room everywhere is the picture so i don't know would my prayer be accepted there but if i don't pray there outside i cannot go at all it's not allowed for me to go out so i pray in the same room where the pictures are uh, towards qibla so if you just let me know would that be acceptable or not and my other question is that uh, when a woman in her menstruation time can she go to the mosque for her lessons uh, because in the mosque there is no study room no quran memorizing room in most everywhere in the women's side there are the praying mats i mean like a carpet in uk most and uh, you know women comes and uh, i just want to know can a woman go for her lessons uh, learning i mean tajweed or tafsir or anything in the mosque uh, uh, in her menstruation time uh, where if she sits on the chair rather avoiding carpet plus uh, if not is it the same ruling for the teacher who is teaching the students because if she doesn't come obviously there's a lot of uh, students not having you know learning so if you just please reply me for these two questions okay thank you sister fauzia from the uk assalamu alaikum sister maya from the usa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh um i Sorry. Are you okay? Um ah uh, yes. Uh I have three question if you don't mind. Go ahead. Okay. My first question is um um if we are traveling and we get clean like uh, during the traveling like in an airplane but we we cannot um get pur- purified before maghrib time and when we get at the final destination is after maghrib time how do we i don't know how to uh, pose that question like how to how do i clean myself or how do i pray i don't know if you understand what i'm trying to say i perfectly understand your question Okay. Um my second question is that like um I missed the last Monday and last Thursday is that possible to fast them on the following Monday knowing that that Monday I'm still I'm I'm going to fast too Okay. Oh, yeah, it has to be separate days. Okay. And the last one um, is iqama allowed for women is also uh, praying by themselves or in a group of women. All right, got three your questions. Sister Bar- Maya from Bar- the Bar- USA. Bar- 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 Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Fawziya from the UK. No, it's not permissible for women to stay in the masjid for the purpose of learning, uh, even though she's not attending the prayer, whenever she has the menses. Okay, the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا جُنُبًا إِلَّا عَابِرِي سَبِيلٍ حَتَّى تَغْتَسِلُوا So, only if a person is crossing in the masjid, like there is an, you know, uh, something necessary, I have to grab from the masjid, I have to drop something to the masjid, but to sit and to stay in the masjid, no. And uh, we've discussed this repeatedly, all our masajid, particularly in the West, should have a facility, a classroom separate from the masjid. Separate in a sense, it is not connected to the prayer room, so that the sisters can attend their classes. And uh, to be honest with you, almost all the masajid I visited in the UK and the Islamic centers, they do have, uh, you know, like separate classrooms. Likewise in, uh, in the States. And uh, whatever applies to the students applies to the teacher as well. And uh, if in your local masjid you don't have this facility, you can attend the class online. But the brothers, those who are in charge, they gotta make an extension or even hire an independent place for that. So women during their menses should not actually sit in the masjid. 
but otherwise they should they should come to the masjid and enjoy praying and learning as much as they want in case that there is no fitna um, assalamu alaikum sister um kulthum from the uk alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Sheikh, I want to ask one question, like when um, somebody goes to toilet for um, number one or number two, the person, if it uh, doesn't uh, use water, she, uh, can he or she pray and read the um, Quran? Well, I didn't get your question, uh, to be honest with you, Sister Umu uh, if, if a person um, goes to toilet and doesn't use water for clean himself or herself, doesn't use what? Doesn't use water for cleaning. Okay, okay, I got your question. You know, using the water for uh, removing the impurities such as istinja after answering the call of nature isn't a must. So at the time, uh, you know, in the past they used to use stones, the least three stones. So if there are toilet papers, tissues, and it would serve the purpose, okay, that will do it as well. And you can make wudu after. As long as you assume that you pray clean. The best means of purification is water. But if it is not available, then you can use the tissues. You can even soak the tissues uh, in water with them. So to use them in the last stage for purification and the removal of the impurities in istinja. Uh, but with that, you can make wudu and you can pray and you can read Quran and do everything. Assalamu alaikum. Ahmed from Kenya. Assalamu alaikum, Ahmed. Ahmed, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead, Akhi. How are you doing, Sheikh? I'm doing great, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Sheikh. Uh, I, I, I didn't listen to the program for a very long time. I'm Ahmed from Kenya, so I have just go to a rural village that I didn't follow the program. But I know. Oh, I'm back. Welcome back, Ahmed. Welcome back. So, what do you have in mind today? Hello. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much, Sheikh. I want to know the transcript. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. We have four lines, mashallah. Why don't you try another line? Thank you. Barakallah fikum. Sister Fawzia from the UK, at work, a lot of photos, a lot of pictures, pictures portraying their God, and uh, I don't know if you're working in a church, but you know, normally at the workplace, they don't carry pictures of Jesus or Mary or, but in any case, uh, even if the room is full of pictures, what matters is whenever you're facing the Qibla, make sure there is no picture on your way. That's it, okay? And I'm sure you would find a place. All you need to do is a clean janamaz. You spray it everywhere, anywhere, and you offer the prayer facing uh, the qibla. Okay? What if there is not? Just put a sutra before you and offer the prayer, and that's it. Sister Maya from the USA, her question is pertaining, what if I'm, you know, I'm stuck in the traffic driving? I don't have wudu, and the time for Maghrib is almost over. What can I do? In this case, there is a, a hukm where a person, if he or she is afraid that by the time I reach the water to make wudu, I will miss the prayer time. Then you can make tayammum. You strike your hands on a dusty surface or on the floor, as long as it's clean. And then one, you wipe over your face, and then your hands, then you pray. Then when you reach your destination and you have wudu, you make wudu and you repeat the prayer with, uh, with wudu, okay? The other alternative is occasionally, and sometimes whenever I'm stuck in the traffic, I cannot even pray in the car and whatever, so it's okay to postpone Maghrib to be joined with Isha, because Maghrib and Isha can be joined together at the time of either one of them. But the earlier hukm, is particularly in case of Asr and it is close to sunset 
or Fajr and it is close to sunrise. So in this case, you make tayammum immediately and pray in any condition. Then when you reach a place where you have water and you can stand up and face the Qibla, you can make the wudu, ablution, stand up and face the Qibla and repeat the same prayer again. Assalamu alaikum, Abdul Razak from United Arab Emirates. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Chef? Alhamdulillah, Akhi, go ahead. Uh, Chef was asking uh, when uh, I joined the Imam in Jama and uh, we are praying uh, Salatul Isha and uh, I, find, I find that uh, they are praying the third rakah. Mm. Uh, I was asking when I'm uh, when I'm praying the rest of the rakahs, do I pray the the second one loudly or I pray it silently? All right, got your question, Abdul Raza from United Arab Emirates. Sister Maya's second question. Mashallah, uh, she fasts on Mondays and Thursdays. If you miss any day, can I make it up? During any other day, yes, of course, you can make it up on Tuesday, on Wednesday, okay? As long as you don't single out Friday with fasting or Saturday. But even if you join Friday and Saturday, you fast on Friday and Saturday, it's okay. But singling out Friday with fasting, voluntary fasting, and singling out Saturday with voluntary fasting is not permissible. But you can make it up during any other day. Women don't have to call iqama whether you're praying by yourself or even if you're praying in congregation. Abdul Razak from United Arab Emirates uh, asked about the prayer of Al-Masbuq, a person who joined the Imam late and he has already started his prayer. So he's in second, third or fourth rakah. You don't have to inquire or ask somebody, which rakah is the Imam praying? And you don't have to worry about it. You join the crowd, you join the jama'ah and you say Allahu Akbar and your intention, that is your first rakah. So that's why even if the Imam is not reciting out loud, like in Dhuhr or Asr, you don't know whether it's his first, second or third. That's your first rak'ah. So you say Allahu Akbar, you recite Al-Fatiha. You have a chance to recite Qul Hu Allahu Ahad or an ayah or ayat. Do it because it's your first rak'ah. It is sunnah to recite after the Fatiha. Likewise with the second rak'ah, even if the Imam sits for tashahud in between, because perhaps that is his third rak'ah, second rak'ah, doesn't matter. So in this case, you, in your second rakah, you recite Fatiha and another surah. If the Imam gives you a chance. If doesn't, then Fatiha is sufficient. In other words, Ya Abdul Razak, when you join the Imam, don't worry about which number of rakah is his or the jama'ah in which rakah. It doesn't matter. What matters is you yourself, Allahu Akbar, that is my first rak'ah. The hadith which is collected by Imam Bukhari, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَمَا أَدْرَكْتُمْ فَصَلُّوا وَمَا فَاتَكُمْ فَأَتِمُوا So in the lot of this hadith, whenever you join, join. And then whatever you missed, complete. Which means, complete means, at the beginning, when you said Allahu Akbar, that was your first rak'ah. Brothers and sisters, we've gotten, uh, we've got to the end of today's episode of Gardens of the Pious. Until next time, I leave you all in the care of the Almighty Allah. I will say this, and I will forgive Allah for you. And I will say Allah to the Prophet Muhammad. And to his family and his family. And peace be upon him. And peace be upon him. And peace be upon him. He warned me humans to be the best. And give his best religion to them. Allah our God is the greatest. The one and only glory to him. So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price. Rasulullah.